Uh, we're going to be in Matthew uh, 15 tonight, uh, picking up where we left off last week. We pretty much, well, we did, we did finish chapter 14. Um, Jesus is now with the disciples over the land of the Gerasenes, in the land of uh, Gerset, um, and now we're, we're going to be dealing with some issues, um, Jesus addressing tradition versus commandment. There's going to be some additional healing, and then we have the second uh, feeding, this time of the 4,000 in the chapter, and that should bring us up to chapter 16 there. And before we begin, we do want to start in a word of prayer, and uh, Dennis, you want to lead us in that opening word? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks and praise for the ability for us to assemble and to study thy word. Uh, we know that uh, thy word is truth. We're so thankful, Father, for the freedom that we enjoy, that we are still able to come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, we just ask that you uh, be with Brandon this evening as he uh, breaks this word to us, and, uh, that he would present it in a simplified manner and uh, give us a ten of ears that we can listen and understand and comprehend. Father, we always pray for those who, uh, who would love to be here in your presence and just not uh, able because of physical handicap or physical ailments. We also pray for the spiritually ill. We pray for the, uh, that uh, your will be done. Father, we always pray for the leaders of our nation, as you tell us, Romans 13, 1 Timothy 2 and 1. Father, we pray for those who are uh, in charge and in leadership roles, Father, that we may live in peace. And also, Father, we pray for their salvation, that they would come to the truth. Father, we just ask that you uh, uh, watch over us as we study this evening. Again, Father, help us to put aside the uh, cares of the world, just focus upon thee and thy son. He who went to that cross for all of us and gave his life so that we may have that home in heaven with thee. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Matthew 15, we'll be reading the first nine verses here in just a second. So, Starts off here, verse 1, that some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever, whatever I have that would help you has been given to God, he is not to honor his father or his mother. By this you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain did they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Okay, so section that is, I think, fairly familiar to many of us, um, but it's a incredibly relevant section, and um, there's a lot of application points we can make here. In fact, we could probably spend all night on this stuff, but we're not going to be here all night on this alone. But anyway, so Jesus is still teaching out in the regions of Galilee. What ends up happening is some Pharisees hear about, so they come down. They're going to investigate and check out this Jesus fellow. And, and so they asked him, why do you, your disciples not wash their hands before the breaking of bread or eating of bread? Um, that is not, not our practice of cleansing ourselves and making sure we're you know, clean to eat, uh, but more of the, it was a ritualistic washing. Uh, because what, by the first century, the Pharisees and Sadducees had pretty exacting laws of purity. In fact, if you were in the marketplace and you even thought that a Gentile was in that same vicinity. Uh, it was expected you were going to go home ritualistically and ceremonially wash yourself, make yourself clean, because you might have breathed the same air as the Gentile, now you have Gentile cooties. Um, so they're basically asking them, why don't you go through this rit 
why don't you and your disciples go through this ritualistic cleansing before you eat? Now, Jesus is going to get, address that directly uh, in verses um, 15 through 20. But first, he deals with the bigger issue here. Um, and that is the fact that they are holding more tightly to their traditions than they are the commandments of God. And he gives the example of these two commandments, or the one commandment where has the promise, honor your father and your mother. Uh, <clears throat> then he cites their practice. He says, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever I have to help you would be given to God. Uh, some of your old translations may say um, Korriban. Um, that is, it's dedicated, it's, it's devoted to God. And, and basically what the practice was is that Jesus is referencing, you know, you know, here we are in first century before Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, retirement, pensions, all that stuff. So your retirement was your children. Um, there was the expectation they were going to take care of you in old age, and that, was, that applied to everyone. Um, that applied to if you were the priest uh, of the Levites or not. You had that obligation to your parents. Um, and, but the practice seems to have been that they would say, basically, says, well, Mom, Dad, I know... You know, I, I know mom's going through medical treatments right now, and you guys just don't have the money, but I would love to help. But, you know, I've already dedicated everything I have to God. You know, I, you don't want me to take and steal from God, do you? And then they would flip it and basically where, well, I would love to help, but I, I can't. And Jesus is basically calling them out on that and says, they, you've neglected, he says in other places, you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, um, and so they're ignoring what the law actually taught in, in order to keep to their traditions. Um, example, modern example of this, uh, well, I'll do one that's a tongue-in-cheek joke from Oregon, and one actually was a statement made to me uh, when I was preaching someplace. The first one was, the, the, the joke in Oregon was, among the brethren, is that 5.30 in the evening was the scriptural time to start evening services. There was that one outlier congregation that started at 5. Um, we said that tongue-in-cheek, but everybody did it. Okay, it, it was a joke. The real one, uh, the real example was I was preaching one time in southern Oregon, actually middle Oregon, um, and an individual came up to me that, you know, he said he had left this one congregation at, at about the 80s or so when they are building their new building. And the reason why he left, he said, because the building didn't look like a church building. Okay, one, I don't know what a church building looks like if you want to get down to brass tacks about. But secondly, that was, more, that was high holding more towards a tradition of how the buildings ought to look than actually, okay, what are they teaching there? What are they following? Are they, are they honoring God? Are they following the Bible? Or are they following the doctrines of men? This individual rather cling to, well, this is how the churches should look, and if they don't look that way, I'm going to move on. It's a, it's a small example, but this happens all the time. You know, you, you change the order of worship or something. Not, not what you do in worship, but, well, we're going to have communion at the end of services today. You'll get some people up in arms about that. Um, you'll get some people up in arms about introducing a new song or not singing old songs or something. That's clinging more tightly to tradition than actually what the Word of God says because there's nothing inherently in those things that are outright condemned there. So he's calling them out on this because they're holding more tightly to, to the tradition um, than what the Word of God actually taught. And he quotes from Isaiah, which is uh, from Isaiah chapter 29, uh, verse 13 there, is where it's found. But he says, This people is honored me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain did they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Now those two verses we could spend forever on. But really, you think about it, the examples of this today would be you have an individual perhaps was taught wrongly. You know, they, they, they're holding to some clear misunderstandings of what the Bible is or its inspiration or whatever else you want to put it. Um, and they're, 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 they're confronted with the truth. And they understand it clearly and they say, no, I wasn't taught that way. This is not what I believe. You know, mom and dad didn't do it this way, so I, I'm going to hold to that rather than what the Bible teaches, and that's just a generic example of that. But then you have you know, more examples of people who paid lip service to Jesus, lip service to his authority, lip service to God, 
But in, in actuality, you would look at verse 8, but their heart is far away from me. They really have no desire. There's no real fervor in their, in their service. Um, you might see this as somebody who professes and says all the right things on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday lives a completely different life. Or in verse 9, these people, do, they do worship God. They claim to follow him, although their heart is far away from him. They, they do worship him, but in vainly. But they hold more tightly to the doctrines of men than to the teaching of God. Um, example of this, I remember talking to an individual online one time. It was about an issue about the text of Matthew 19. Um, this was back when the, before the Obergefell decision when the um, same-sex union issue was coming up. And the, the point was, well, my church doesn't teach that my church sees that that's okay. And there's nothing in the Bible that says, you know, that, that that's forbidden. I quoted scripture directly, and loving matter says, well, God specified in Matthew 19 that man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one, one flesh. What God has specified, we cannot generalize. So because he specified this, he wrote everything else. The answer I got back was, that's just your interpretation. I don't believe that. That's not my interpretation. That's what the text said. So that would be an example of professing a faith in God, worshiping God in a vain way, but when push came to shove versus the Bible versus what their particular church or teacher or whatever they taught, they clung to the precepts of men rather than the teaching of God. Paul? Christianity is ultimately about submitting to Christ's authority. And there's not really much of a test when I already agree with what Christ says. It's when Christ says something that, left to my own reason, I wouldn't come to that conclusion, or I'd prefer to do otherwise, that the real test of my faith and my obedience is. Am I going to submit to his authority, or, I'm, or am I only going to do what he says when it's what I would have done already? Right. So what Paul just said is that the, the real application test of this section isn't when the Bible lines up with what I'm already doing. That, that's, not, that's not the real test because we're already doing those things. You know. uh, the real test is when the Bible or when Jesus says something, teaches something that is completely contrary to how I have already thought about it or I've already come up with a solution or whatever, how I would have done something. The real test is Am I going to set aside my preconceived ideas, my own thoughts, and bring myself in subjection to God? Because Christianity, at the bottom line, at the end of the day, is are you going to submit to God and his authority, or are you not? There's no partial obedience. Uh, you could look at 1 Samuel chapter 15 with King Saul. He obeyed partially, but God rebuked him for full disobedience because he did not obey the word of God. He didn't submit himself fully to God's authority. Um, because ultimately, the fundamental act of salvation, of, you know, that confession, in that confession is, I don't know it, I can't do it, I need you and you to do it and save me and then guide me. So anytime we start venturing off saying, well, I think I know better than Almighty God, I would say we're on thin ice, but we're on no ice. There's no room for that, that statement there. So, any further comment or question here on this section? Okay. So, Jesus continues on. He, he, he says this to the Pharisees and the scribes. In verse 10 through 14, he says, after, after Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to him, Hear and understand. It is not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. The disciples came to him and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So it's interesting that the disciples are kind of, they're, they're in a shock, they're, they're gasping. Jesus, do you know that you just, you, you hurt the Pharisees' feelings there when you said that? You offended them? And Jesus goes, well, okay, moving on. You know, we have more important things to talk about than what the Pharisees feel and think. 
Um, so he, he says here, and he's correcting this understanding, because the Pharisees are like, okay, ritualistic cleansing, we need to make sure this is all done. He says, and he says to the whole crowd, hear and understand. So get this, underline this. It's not what enters into the mouth of the man that defiles him. It's not whatever you eat, whatever you come in contact with. It's what comes out. And he's not talking about vomiting. Uh, you go back, what we dealt with a couple weeks ago, um, in Matthew chapter 12. There the Pharisees were rebuked for blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But in Matthew chapter 12, uh, in verse 34, he says to the Pharisees there, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak of that which is good? For the mouth speaks out that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure that which is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. The, Jesus is saying here that the, how you conduct yourself, what you say, how you act, the outward, demonstration, the outward demonstrations are a reflection of the inward character. Um, you know, James would say in James chapter 4, I believe, Yes, chapter 4. Um, a fountain cannot bo both produce salt water and fresh water. Chapter 3, thank you, Paul. Uh, a, vine, you know, a fig tree cannot produce grapes and a grapevine cannot produce figs. You know, there, are certain con there are certain things, you know, if you go to an apple orchard, you're not going to get pears or oranges. That's a better phrase. You're going to get apples. So you could, you're not going to expect a wicked person than to produce good fruit or to do righteous things. Intentionally, that is. They might do accidentally. That's what Paul's uh, point in Romans chapter 1 through 3 uh, really is. People can accidentally follow the law. Um, but it's going to be what reveals their character. So he's saying here is, back in Matthew 15, it's not what you ingest that's going to defile you. Is that what comes out of you? That's a reflection of who you are. Um, so the disciples then come up and says, they're gasping. You offended the Pharisees. And he says, let them be. Uh, they're blindly in the blind. And, and he doesn't really address it. It's like, this is, this is what it is. He moves on from there. So, comment, question, thought. Maybe a good reminder for those watching at home. You can email your questions on tonight's class at questions for class at yahoo.com. And that four is the number four not spelled out, but the number, actual number four. Okay, so moving on to verse 15, and this next section, 15 through 20. Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Um, and this is the point we were making previously when we went back to Matthew 12. Um, but basically, again, Jesus' point. These, these food coming in contact with Gentiles, being, you know, for us... It would be associating with non-Christians or whatever. That doesn't defile you. That doesn't uh, somehow make you unsanctified. It's the stuff that proceeds out of you. How you conduct yourself, how you talk, how you talk about people, how you talk to people, how you deal with people. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I forgot what book I was reading um, or what, what the source was, but I remember reading this point that um, they said one of the tests you need to do uh, before you marry a person is, is take them to a restaurant during peak dinner service when the wait staff might be a little bit behind and slow and see how they treat the wait staff. Um, if they treat the wait staff poorly, I, it doesn't matter what else you think about that person, that person's probably not the best fit for you because how they treat people who wait on them is a pretty good in indication how they treat other people as well. If they treat them fine or well, you probably have a pretty good person. Uh, the same thing was said about make them use internet from 1998 or take them camping. Um, one way, you know, put them in situations where there's going to be some stressors, that's going to reveal the real character of a person uh, when you get in those situations. 
Um, and so that's what Jesus' point here is. And it's interesting, he doesn't give any more teaching on this because we go right on to the, he the healing of this woman here uh, who is not a Jew, she's a Gentile. Uh, and this reveals something interesting too about, um, again, the nature of faith and, and the role of Gentiles will eventually have. Uh, but before we move on to this uh, discussion of tradition and commandment, anyone have a question, comment, thought, disagreement? I won't fault you. Okay. All right. Starting verse 21, we'll read through 28. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from, the ta from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. So it's a pretty straightforward healing. What's interesting, though, is the exchange between this woman and Jesus. And, and what's interesting is why perhaps Jesus is ignoring her to begin with. Um, so, again, she's a Canaanite woman, so she's a Gentile. Uh, the law was very clear. Jews were to have no dealings with Gentiles. Uh, to do so, well, no dealings in the sense of routine or prolonged contact. Um, so it's interesting because Jesus, you know, he's following the law. But she keeps insisting and pestering and, and pushing at this, at this point. Um, and so he gives the answer. You know, the disciples have said, you know, send her away. She's making a scene. It's getting embarrassing. And he replies to her and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, he's not, in my opinion, not contradicting himself. He's not breaking the law here at all. He's, you know, because we've already been told previously in the gospel accounts, um, I believe it's in John's gospel. Um, let's see here. Maybe John's gospel earlier in, in Matthew. I'm going to quote it and then we'll find it. Um, Jesus speaks about how he is the good shepherd. I'm forgetting where at in John that is, but he speaks about how he has other sheep not of this fold. He's talking about Israel there. Other sheep that he will bring in. Uh, and so I'm of the opinion here that Jesus is doing this intentionally for the disciples' benefit and for the people around's benefit. Um, because Jesus knows the intent of this woman. So she keeps on pestering or insisting um, and really the interesting exchange is in 26 and 27, where he says it's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Now, he's not using that as, the word there, if I remember correctly, it's not, a, it's, not a pejor, it's not used pejoratively as in like a mangy mutt or something or, or, or a, you know, a stray dog, but more like a, more like a puppy. Um, so he's, he's not being derogatory. It's just he's making a, an analogy here or simile. And this woman shows great wisdom in verse 27. And it's one of the cases where um, one could say God marveled at this, this bubble of faith here, but she says, yes, it's not good to take away the, the children's food and give it to the puppy begging underneath the table, but even the dogs do feed on that which drops down from the table. And so Jesus says, truly your faith is great, your daughter has been made well. So again, we're seeing a great lesson of faith here, that true faith doesn't stop at roadblocks. Doesn't stop when there's a hiccup or there's a, you know, somebody, they were taught wrong at some point. True faith continues to seek after Jesus, no matter the roadblocks, no matter the obstacles, and true faith in the end is rewarded. Um, we see that in verse 28 there. So, questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, um, moving on then. Um, so we're going to read 29, actually. We're going to read 29 through the end of the chapter. Uh, 29 and 31, 
is this some more healings that are taking place? It's a very straightforward section as much as this chapter has been. Then we get to the feeding of the 4,000. So it says there, departing from there, Jesus went along to the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up to, onto the mountain, he was sitting there. And large crowds came to him, bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. Then they laid him, And they laid them down at his feet, and he healed them. So the crowd marveled as they saw the mute speak, the cripple restored, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people, as they have remained with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, for they might faint on, on the way. The disciples said to him, Where were we going to get so many loaves for this, uh, in this desolate place to satisfy such a large, large crowd? And Jesus said to him, How many loaves do you have? And he said to him, Seven and a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish, and giving thanks, he broke them and started giving to them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate the, uh, were the 4,000 men besides women and children. And sending away the crowds, Jesus got up uh, in, in the boat and came to the region of Magadan. Okay, so again, we have more uh, healings here. Uh, we're, we're, ra- we're ramping up right before the transfiguration, as we're going to get into in the next uh, couple weeks. Um, and, and so the, the manifestations and the miracles are becoming more frequent. And again, kind of going back to the point I've made several times in classes and sermons, the purpose of miracles, again, was to show that this person is of God, from God, and that God is approving of what they are teaching. Um, and these miracles would be to such the extent that even the hostile witnesses, the Pharisees and Sadducees, would not be able to deny them. Uh, for example, in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, I believe, um, when the apostles are working miracles, um, in verse 16 of Acts chapter 4, the, the Sanhedrin, actually the high priestly council, is meeting to figure out what to do with Peter and John. They say, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Um, so these miracles, again, they're, they're showing that Jesus is sent from God, he is approved by God, but what he is teaching is true. And it's interesting, again, we see more lessons about faith because this crowd here, we don't know how large it actually was other than at least 4,000 men, probably much more than that. Um, they stayed with Jesus for three days without eating. They were so intent on listening to him, of seeing these miraculous powers, they're, they're marveling and they're glorifying God. You see that at the end of verse 31. So Jesus in 32 feels compassion on them because they've been with him this long, so he works another miracle, and he multiplies the loaves and the fishes again, as he did a few short chapters ago in chapter 14, excuse me, last chapter with the feeding of the 5,000. And much like there, again, they all ate and were satisfied, so this is not just crumbs that he's giving people. It's It's large portions that they're able to eat and be satisfied from. Okay. Thought, comment, question on chapter 15. Caleb. I won't fault you for that.
Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus knows the heart of every man. We know that. And as Caleb stated, he, he knew that the, the first 5,000 was more artificial. It's just like he stated. He berated them afterwards because all they were there were was to get a free meal. But in here, I've always understood this to be, these are the loyal followers, and he understands that. So he doesn't yeah, treat Caleb. them the same as the others. Caleb's right. Appreciate that. So what basically to summarize what Caleb's point was, um, we do see a contrast here in the two feedings. Uh, remembering back from chapter 14, which parallels with John chapter 6. John chapter 6 actually gives the full account there of what happened. Uh, John chapter 6, again, feeding of the 5,000. Jesus does that. They come back the next day. They're wanting to be fed again because Jesus rebukes them in verse 26 of John 6. Uh, Truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. And then at the end of that, after he continues on, he pushes them further and further and further. Verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So the feeding of the 5,000, at least, they're rebuked because they're falling from impure motives. They made no preparations. Um, while nothing in the text explicitly says in chapter 15 that these people did prepare, it is a reasonable inference to make that, yeah, it seems that there was some preparation because they have intently stayed with Jesus for three days. And it's at that point that Jesus, instead of rebuking, feels compassion. Um, they have seen the works and they are glorifying God. And in verse 31, in, Matthew, in John 6 and Matthew 14, uh, they saw the signs and they did not glorify God. They saw the signs and wanted more signs. They wanted more food. Um, so yeah, that was a really good point, Caleb. I appreciate that. Uh, because, you know, as Dennis said too, these are the, in contrast to chapter 14, Matthew, these 5,000, they're looking for a meal ticket. Here in 15, these seem to be the loyal disciples. Um, but they didn't come to him initially for the feeding. The feeding is a secondary accidental thing. They've, these are the, this is the group. Um, uh, let's see here. It, it may be some of the same people in chapter early part of chapter 15, but these people have sought him out, verse 30. He's already gone to the Sea of Galilee up on the mountain alone. These people weren't following him, but they sought him out, verse 30. And they brought to him all the people who were crippled, blind, mute, many others. And he heals them, and they glorify God because of that. Really appreciate that, Caleb and Dennis. Anything further? Go ahead. I know it's, it seems like you're looking for a little bit of the evidence about the miracles, and to me, Acts 2 and 22 spells that out completely. Because what's it say? It says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was attested by God to you by the, what, miracles, signs, and wonders that he right. performed. So I'm saying, is, that to me, that, that uh, part of the Bible, Acts 2 and 22, tells you exactly why he did miracles. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start chapter 16. Um, we'll probably get a good chunk of the way uh, done with the remaining time we have tonight. So, again, um, so verse 39 of chapter 15 starts the thought of chapter 16. So we're going to start in verse 39. We'll read through verse 4 of chapter 16. And sitting away the crowd, Jesus uh, got into the boat and came to the region of Magadan. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up, and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you, uh, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? An evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, much like the people in John 6, are not just asking for a sign. They're specifying a sign from heaven, which in John 6 and elsewhere in the Gospels was basically synonymous with they wanted manna. They wanted the bread from heaven that God gave to the children of Israel during the Exodus. So they're asking not just, again, not for any miracle, but in a sense, in their mind, the miracle 
Um, now, Jesus rebuked the crowds in John 6 um, for that. But he, he rebukes the Pharisees and the Sadducees more sternly than the crowds in John 6 because the Sadducees and Pharisees, they were teachers of the law. They were the priests. They were the people in the position to know. They are the people who had access to law at all times. They spent the first 33 years of their lives training to enter priestly service. Um, they were the ones that taught in the synagogue. So they were supposed to be the ones who were to clearly see the coming of the Christ. But Jesus rebukes them because he says, you guys know how to tell the weather. You see the sun you know, it's a certain way, the moon looks a different way, so it's going to mean this in the morning. But you can't read the sign of the times. Because by this point in the Gospel of Matthew, it's not like Jesus is just coming out into his ministry. It's not like he's some obscured person in the region of Galilee causing some religious ruckus. He is clearly known. The miracles have been clearly shown. He is, clear, he is teaching everywhere. He's been to the, to the temple multiple times um, to teach. And so it's not that they're ignorant of what's been happening. These are all, again, clear signs that the Messiah has come. Now, we go back a couple chapters when we dealt with the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Um, let's see here. So the crowds in that chapter, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 23, after he heals the blind man, um, he says, all the crowds were amazed and were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? And basically, he's not ta- they're not asking about, they're not saying, oh, this possibly couldn't be him. They're asking more inquisitively, like, is this really the guy? Is he here? Their people are starting to get it. Um, and the Pharisees don't like that. And they're, they're outright refusing. They have pre-concluded from the outset that this Jesus of Nazareth cannot be the Christ uh, because he doesn't meet our preconceived idea of who the Messiah is going to be. So he rebukes him for that there. Um, anything on this first introductory thought? Okay. Uh, moving on then, uh, verse 5, and we'll read through, well, verse 12. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, and they, but they had forgotten to, uh, to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, He said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that, uh, that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand and remember the five loaves of the 5,000? Or how many baskets full you picked up? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000? How many large baskets full you picked up? How is it then that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not say beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. In the book I'm reading currently, titled Truth War by John MacArthur, it makes this point going through church history of the first two centuries of all, these, uh, all, all the early heresies that the most dangerous thing about false teaching, the most dangerous thing about teaching that can lead somebody astray is that it is subtle. Uh, leaven is such a small part of, of making bread or of that, and yet it rises the whole lump. It rises the whole loaf. It affects the whole, even though it's a small bit. And so he's warning them to beware of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees because that teaching has within it the kernel, the seed, the leaven, to lead them astray. Um, And the application is today, we have to be incredibly discerning. Not everything we hear that sounds great is. Everything must be met with discernment um, to see if it actually is worthy of accepting and believing or if it's worth, if it needs to be rejected. And he's warning them because, again, the Pharisees and Sadducees both had their issues. Um, The Sadducees, uh, even though they denied, um, excuse me, let me make sure I'm getting this right because I I will mix them up. Um, Yes, 
Okay, so the Sadducees denied the resurrection, they denied an afterlife, they denied all the heavenlies, but they interpreted the law more uh, strictly than the Pharisees did. Uh, so uh, we would say more accurately, even though they denied certain core teachings about it. The Pharisees, however, they viewed more than just the Torah and everything. They, they recognized an afterlife and everything else, but they were kind of more loose with the law. They thought it was more about ethical conduct and moral teaching rather than the exactness of the law. And so both of those camps, there's some redeeming qualities and there's some damning qualities. The Pharisees did not deny the resurrection or the, the, the heavenlies or the, the host of heaven. They didn't deny those, some of those core teachings. Uh, but the dangerous part of the Pharisees was they, paid, they played fast and loose with God's word. Sadducees, on the other hand, denied core teachings such as the resurrection. But they were exacting in the law as God expects us, us to be, to accurately handle it. So he's warning them, don't fall you know, lock, stock, and barrel for their teaching. You've got to be discerning about it. You've got to weigh it. Um, and the same warning is for us as well today. Brett? Also, he's getting to the heart. Right. The Pharisees had become very good, or at least thought they were good, at all the outward appearances. Mm -hmm. Looked wonderful. I mean, and that's what, you got to go back to 15 again. How he right. Talks, what defiles you, it's what comes out of the heart. And then, you know, later in, was it, chapter 23, he calls them whitewashed tombs. Mm -hmm. Beautiful on the outside. But, uh, what is it, verse 20? Seven, full of dead man's bones, you know, and just nothing righteous about you. Uh, I'm trying to find where it is now. You look like, yeah, verse 27, you look like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside full of dead man's bones. Right. All uncleanness. So he's getting, I mean, what you said is true, it's just a, but it's right. just another layer. And he's just, beware of that. And that's, that's a good beware for us. Well, yeah, because you, you let's apply that today. Um, you have individuals who profess that they're Christians, whether or not that's true, you know, that's, that's for the word to discern, discern, uh, determine, but they will have all the outward trappings, and they will emphasize the good moral conduct. We need, to, we need to live by the teachings of the Bible. But when it comes to bringing themselves completely underneath subjection to God, of completely and totally following him, and on the reverse, you can have people that are incredibly accurate with the Word of God, have all the right doctrines, they're exact with the Word as God expects us to be, but they are far from Him. They have, the, the motivations are not there, the, the desire is not there, the actual love of God is not there. They're, they'd rather be right for the sake of being right than for the sake of righteousness and holiness before God and being pleasing to Him. Uh, both are dangerous. Both can lead to uh, two extremes there. So, any further thought, comment, question here? We're nearing about the end. Um, I think this is a good stopping point since we've completed the thought there. We will pick up in verse 13 next time. Uh, verses 13 through 20 should be familiar to many of us because it's Peter's confession of Christ and, and it's where Jesus talks about how he's going to build his church, singular. Um, and then he's going to start teaching more publicly, well, more directly to the disciples about his coming death. We're going to talk about the cost of uh, discipleship, and we'll probably start the transfiguration um, next time as well. So thank you all for coming. Appreciate those who tuned in, and uh, we'll pick it up next time.